All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So we have been talking about series, which are basically special kinds of sequences, right? How? How are they special kinds of sequences? A series is a sequence of partial sums of a series, right? Uh, of a uh, sequ it's a sequence of partial sums, uh, and uh, so we can we can talk about what it means for a series to converge. And what I want to do today is build on what we talked about last time. So last time we said, oh, okay, how do we tell if a series converges? You know, what if you have a series like the following? 1 over n squared. Well, that's a series. It's a sum of a bunch of terms. Dot, dot, dot. Okay. And so what we mean by a series is, look at this sequence, the sequence of partial sums, and ask, does it converge? Okay. <clears throat> and what are some of the things we talked about last time? How do we test for convergence of a series? Let's just review a little bit. How do we test for convergence of a series? Okay, well, we can compare to things we know. That's right. Uh, and comparison says compare term, term by term to see if it's dominated in some way, right? Uh, but what would you compare to, for instance? What's one, one thing you, that, that's a, one of the big, the big things you compare to? Well, like a series you already know, right? And a series you already know, one of the big ones is the geometric series. You know that that converges. We showed that that converges last time. Uh, so last time we actually did several examples of things where we could actually, by clever comparisons, show that they converged as well. So eventually we showed that the sum of 1 over n to the p converges as long as p is bigger than 1. We actually did that by a very clever comparison, right? But the comparison test itself has its roots in what? The comparison um, methodology. Cauchy criterion, right? The Cauchy criterion for sequences uh, when applied to series gives a Cauchy criterion for series, okay? We just want to know, just uh, want to see if, if we can show if this, the tails are, are bounded, then we're in, in, in very good shape, okay? Okay, great. So that's um, what we did last time. And what I want to do today is to do a few more tests, and these are all ones that you're familiar with, but you perhaps have not yet seen why they are true. Okay, so uh, here's a big one. This one is called the root test. And its, uh, its companion is something called the ratio test. And this is for series. So it says something like the following. If you're given a series, the sum of a sub n, <coughs> Anybody remember how you test using the, the root test, whether a series converges? Let's see, root. What does root refer to? Taking a root, the nth root. Some of you may not have learned this in high school. Who knows? Um, so it says, OK, look at a certain thing. And I will fill in the blank in a minute. Let alpha equal blah. OK, I'm not going to fill this in in a second. Then. Uh, if alpha is less than 1, this series converges. And if alpha is greater than 1, the series diverges. And if alpha equals 1, the test is inconclusive. <coughs> OK, now that, let's see. Does that ring a bell here? What is alpha? Anybody remember? The root test, what, what, what the criterion is? Let's see. It has something to do with the terms. This is the sum of a sub n's. Nth root of a sub n, does that ring a bell? Nth root of a sub n? Yeah, what do you do with that, nth root of a sub n? You just do it for one? No, you look at all of them, and you see if they what? What do you do with all the sequence of a, the nth roots of a sub n's? How, how is alpha related to the nth root of a sub n? It's the limit as n goes to infinity? Well, yeah, that's how you learn it in high school, but it's actually not, not the best way of stating it, because that limit may not exist. 
But here's something that always exists. The limit may not exist, but the limb soup actually always exists. So let's take the limb soup of the nth root of a sub n. This thing always exists, or it might be, you know, possibly infinite, but the point is uh, it can be calculated in the extended reals. Okay? So this is, or you probably don't learn about limb soups in high school, I'm guessing. No. All right. Okay. So let's see why this is true. Why do you think this is true? How do you think the root's going to help us? Taking the nth roots. Give me some intuition here. Why is it that if this, these terms behave like the, uh, let's see, if the nth roots, uh, if, if these terms uh, have the property that you take their nth root, they, that thing approaches some limit and that limit's less than one, then what? What does this behave like? What are you trying to say this thing behaves like? Imagine, suppose this number's alpha. And this thing is kind of like a n is then like alpha to the n, isn't it? Then what does this series look like? Geometric. Excellent. It's geometric. So what do you think we're going to do to show that this thing converges? We're going to make a comparison with the geometric series. Wonderful. OK, so that's our plan. So our proof is by comparison with the geometric series. That's the whole idea. Almost all the good uh, comparisons are ones with a geometric series. So here's what we'll do in the case where alpha is less than 1. So if alpha is less than 1, well, that means that, in fact, I can fix a beta. I'll choose a beta in between. So I'll choose beta between alpha and 1. OK. OK, so what does this mean? If there's a beta between alpha and 1, well, wouldn't you agree that then uh, there is a big N, there's a number. So look, beta is bigger than this limb soup. If beta is bigger than this limb soup, that means there's a point in the sequence beyond which what? All the terms are smaller than beta. Excellent. Wonderful. Yeah, so there is a big N such that little n bigger than big N implies that the nth root of a sub n is uh, less than beta. Okay. Oh, by the way, I, I that a sub n, that really should be a, this really should be an absolute value, right? Because the a n's might be negative. And similarly here. OK. So good. There's a point beyond which all the terms are less than beta. Good. So we're going to compare with a geometric series whose ratio is beta. And now fr from here on out, you can probably see what to do. Well, what is this? OK, this is by the definition of limb soup. OK. But what does this thing mean? This is the same as saying, for this n bigger than n, uh, alpha n in absolute value is less than beta to the n. For little n bigger than big n. Hooray. We're in good shape. That's it, basically. And um, what do you know about beta to the n? It converges. Some of the beta to the n converges. So. That means the sum of the a n's can, uh, uh, that means what? I, I can compare uh, the a n's to the b n's, right? So the sum of the a n's converge as well. Um, so the sum of the a n's uh, converge as well. Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. So the sum of the a n's converge as well. 
Yeah, so then why does that mean the original series converges? The one without the absolute value of the AM? Why? Drew? So if the sum of the AMs converge, why, why, uh, yeah, so why does this give us what, why does this give us what we, what we need? <coughs> well, when you take that conversion, mm -hmm. is it a dependent on this point? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Then it does not have to converge to this point. Yeah, so we actually have, have what we need, right, yeah, that's right. Yeah, so actually we don't need to say this, right? Yeah, so the comparison test actually gives us this. We just need this thing to be smaller. Okay, excellent. So what about if alpha is bigger than 1? What do you think happens? What goes wrong when alpha is bigger than 1? Well, that means this limb soup is bigger than 1. That means what? Eventually what? Or not eventually, but the fact that limb soup is bigger than 1 means that there's a subsequence that converges to something bigger than 1. But if the subsequence converges to something bigger than 1, basically that means the terms don't go to 0, right? That's the, that's the intuition. So there exists a subsequence uh, sum of, let's, let's say, n sub k, a sub n k, that converges to some alpha bigger than 1. So what? Well, that means a sub n k is bigger than 1. I mean, this converges something bigger than 1. Then this thing is going to be bigger than 1 for infinitely many terms. So the terms don't go to 0. Terms do not go to 0. So the series diverges. There, that's the basic message. OK. And so then the final case is, what if alpha is 1? Well, the test is inconclusive. You might uh, say, well, haven't we already? Is there anything to show? Well, yeah, there is something to show. I want to show you that there are examples of series that, for which the ratio test gives uh, the ratio zero, uh, 1, and the series diverges, and other examples where it converges. So if alpha is 1, you can check that. Um, Notice that the sum of 1 over n uh, diverges. The sum of 1 over n squared converges. And for both of these, they both have alpha equal 1. Okay. But what's the basic message? Compare with the geometric series. All right. Here's another uh, test, a famous test, the ratio test. It's the the cousin of, of the root test. Now, um, the ratio test says to look at what? Anybody remember? You want to check a series converges? Look at the ratio of successive terms. OK, good. Let's just uh, uh, say what it's, the test is. <coughs> so the claim is. The sum of the ANs converge if what? Well, what do I do with those ratios of successive terms? I take their, yeah, OK. You might say take their limit, but again, the limit may not exist. That's a high school version, right? You, you give a simple case. But in this case, we're going to look at the lim soup of the ratios a n uh, plus 1 over a n, a sub n plus 1 over a sub n. And I'll look at this limb soup, and it converges if this limb soup is less than 1. Very good. And it diverges if, uh, if what? Well, yeah, we're gonna, I'm going to say it this way. The sum of a sub, the, the ratio of a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is bigger than or equal to 1 
for uh, n large enough. Okay, for all n bigger than some number. Okay. Now, um, it has a similar feeling as the root test. Uh, and uh, the thing I, maybe I just want to leave you with is the, 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 the root test is actually way more powerful. But the ratio test often is easier to, to, to use. Okay, so this is easier. The root test uh, is powerful. The ratio test is easier. It's often easier to use, if you can use it. Okay. Okay. Now, the, the, um, yeah, so, I mean, the ratio test, I mean, uh, the reason that it's, it's not always so, so powerful is that there, there are sequences which converge, but for which this uh, ratio thing is, uh, you know, it doesn't, uh, doesn't give uh, um, much information, right? So you might imagine a sequence like, um, oh, how about this one? One, one, one half, one half, <coughs> one third, one third, dot, dot, dot. Well, the, this ratio of successive terms, every other, every other ratio is going to be 1 here, isn't it? Right? 1, um, here, let's make this more e easier. 1 over 2 to the, 1 over 2, 1 over 4, 1 over 8. So basically, the successive ratios here are 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2. Etc. Yeah. And so, oh, did I have that? I, I guess it, it's one half. <coughs> okay. And so, what do I have here for this sequence? Well, this test, the ratio test here, is not going to tell me very much, right? And it's just because you have this kind of funny, this funny situation. Oh, that looks like a smiley face. Oh, they all do. That's cool. Didn't even attend that. Um, yeah, so that's why we the ratio test is maybe not so always so powerful, but um, it's certainly helpful in 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 many cases. Okay, so how are we going to prove it? Comparison again, and I'll just sketch this for you. Would you agree that because the limb soup is less than one, once again, there's a beta? in between for which this is eventually less than beta. That's the same idea. So then um, basically in uh, the first situation, we have a sub n plus 1 over a sub n is less than beta, which is less than 1 for some beta and uh, for n bigger than some n. This is a sketch. I'm just giving you the highlights. It's like that our argument. Now what? Why is this going to help me compare? And what am I going to compare to again? Geometric series. Tell me, the, give me the intuition. Why is this going to help me compare this to the geometric series? A sub 1, n plus 1 is? Richard's thinking, oh, look, it's like, less than a beta a sub n, right? So each time I'm introducing, at most, a factor beta. So we have um, a sub n plus 1 in absolute value is less than beta a sub n. Yeah? But wait, what's that? I could keep going here if I wanted. Beta squared a sub n minus 1 less than beta cubed a sub n minus 2, et cetera. But what you find eventually is, uh, the, is you can go for as far back as you want, and you just introduce a new beta uh, each time. So what you could see is, if you want, you could see the following. A sub n, a sub big N sub k is less than, by the same argument, beta to the k of a sub n. So if you go any farther than big N, 
such as k more places, it's, you can compare it to a sub n beta the k. And so what you have then is exactly what you need, namely uh, the sum of the a sub n's. Let's see what we'll do here. Let's start at a sub n and look at the tail. So that's how we're using the Cauchy criterion again. k goes from 0 to infinity. This is just a sub n times a certain sum of beta to the k. But this thing converges. So this tail is bounded by a sub n sum b to the k. And that's enough to give us a uh, convergence of, um, of uh, our uh, series. Sorry, that's a sub n, isn't it? Thank you. OK. Um, great. OK, and then what happens in the, uh, the other case for the divergence case? For a divergence, we can see what the tails, this, the terms don't go to zero. Don't go to zero. Okay. Okay, so it's just very similar spirit. All right. So um, we've developed a lot of tests for series. One of the most important series uh, that you encounter are power series. What is a power series? Well, a series is, a, is basically a sum of a bunch of numbers. A power series might involve variables. So um, if Cn is complex, possibly complex coefficients, a power series is something like this. Cn z to the n is a power series. So I'll think of this as maybe a constant plus C1 times a co a z plus c2 times z squared plus dot 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 and it goes on and goes from 0 to infinity. This is a power series. Why do you think it's called a power series? It's a series of powers, okay, of z. z here you think of some basically a complex variable in z a complex variable, or real vari variable. I'm just keeping this general. OK, Okay. so here's a question you might ask. <clears throat> if I have given, a I'm given a bunch of Cs, right? So Leon gives me a bunch of Cs like this. And I, I say, OK, well, for what values of Z does this series converge? That's a question. When does z, what this series converge? So for what z does it converge? There's a question. And th the nice answer to that is, hey, you know what? We can use our, our knowledge of series convergence tests to answer the question. So here's a big theorem for series. If alpha is, no surprise here, let's look at the limb soup uh, of the nth root of. Now, if I were to just apply this particular uh, root test to the power series, what should I put in these absolute values there? Cn, z to the n, yes? But if I put them in here, c and z to the n, and I take the nth root, then you can see I have the z to the n and the nth root combine, yes? Would give me a z or something, right? And normally, then, I'd be comparing that ratio to 1, yes? But that involved, there's a z involved there, yes? So if I ignore the dependence on z, Let's call this thing alpha, and I just take the nth root of cn, and then 
let r be 1 over alpha. There's the 1 that's making its appearance. Then the claim is the cn z to the n converges if the absolute value of r, uh, sorry, if the absolute value of z is less than r. And it diverges if the absolute value of z is bigger than r. And this r has a special name. It's called the, good, radius of convergence. So some of you have seen this in other courses. The surprise is the set of all places where this series converges actually forms a disk. It's a circle in the plane. It's centered around 0 in this case. And uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's, a, it, it, it's amazing it's a circle. But you can see where it comes from, because the proof involves the root test. And what you find is basically the sum of, uh, sorry, the rate root, nth root of a n in this case is z times the nth root of c n, where a n is uh, c n z n, z to the n. And what you're hoping is that the limb soup of this is less than one, right? So we stick in limb soup here, and I stick in a limb soup here. I'm hoping to compare this to 1. But wait, what's this part? This part is the thing I've defined to be, I've called this alpha here. And so really, we're just looking at comparing z to 1 over alpha. That's where the r comes from. OK, so this is the proof idea. I'm not going to carry out the the proofs very carefully here, because you can, you can see it re written carefully in your book. But the idea is what you should remember. We're just using the root test. OK. OK, power series. Yeah, that's great. OK, more stuff is said about power series, actually, in Math 132. OK, and also, if you take Fourier, you'll, you do power series. If you take, um, you could. Uh, well, you explore them more in other classes, so I won't say too much more about them here. <clears throat> Here's a question for you. Speaking of series, what if I have two series, uh, two sequences, a n, b n, and I want to know something about how to combine them and study, study them? So here's a question. What can I say about the sum of a n, b n? Um, can I say something about the sum of a n, b n? There's a question. And the main excuse for trying to answer this question is to show you something I think is really neat. And the book doesn't actually, it does talk about this, but doesn't actually say why. It's called this, and that's the idea of summation by parts. So summation by parts, um, by, the by parts should remind you of something. Like integration by parts. So let me, let, let's see if you can figure out when I write this down how this is like integration by parts. Summation by parts is quite cool. It says if you have a sequences like a n, b n, well, let's let big A sub n be partial sums of a sub k, where k goes from 0 to n. Can't stop me from defining that. OK. Uh, and this is defined for n bigger than 0. But just to make my formula work out, I'm going to set a sub minus 1 equal to 0. Okay, so I, I may need to refer to a subscript that's a minus 1, okay, just to make the formula work out. Then something uh, in, very amazing is true. If I want to sum a n, b n, let's say going from p to q, 
And if you don't mind, I'm going to just not write the, the, the index here. I'll just write the P and Q so from now on because it's clear what the index is. The claim is this is the same as, check this out, the sum of big A sub n, little b sub n minus little b sub n plus 1. And here n goes from p almost to q is q minus 1. I guess I will write the n here so you know that's the index. Plus, OK, a sub q, little b sub q, minus a sub p minus 1, little b sub p. Somebody tell me how this is like integration by parts. What are some general features of this formula that remind you of integration by parts? Integration by parts says something loosely like um, you want to integrate u dv, then that's uv minus integral of v du. Integrals are like sums. Yeah? You'll learn that more in Math 132, actually, but integrals are like sums. Okay. So if I want to integrate u dv, what's playing the role of u here and what's playing the role of dv? Anybody see this? Bonnie? Um, maybe is it? What's playing the role of the integrals here? Integral, integral, yes. OK, good. Good. Uh, what's playing the role of u? There's a u and a dv, and you want to, something from here, ch dv from here should correspond to something like v here. So what's playing the role of dv and v? A, yes, A, big A is playing the role of U. And if you let big A be the partial sums, then the change in big A is little a at every step, right? So what's playing the role of big A is, big A is kind of like U. And so then DU, uh, sorry, big A, yes, integral of U, D, sorry. Um, integral of, uh, sorry, I mean v. Big A is playing the role of v. Then dv is, is like little a, right? OK. Uh, and then what's playing the role of u? u dv, that's v, right? v is playing the role of u. And what's playing the role of db? du. It's this change here, right? So what we have is this is like the integral of uh, dv u is the integral of u, uh, uh, v du, that's this part, minus what? uv or vu. Yes? Now, why do I have two terms here? Yes, you've got to evaluate the endpoints. There's a P, there's a Q, there's a P. OK, this is not quite the same. There's a minus 1 there. But this is going from OK, something P-like to something Q-like. It's, it's not quite there, OK? But it's close, right? So maybe I'll circle this a little bit. There's just, it's just a little bit off, right? OK, but in the, in, in the limit, <laughs> if, you, what, if you, yes, these are exactly the same concept. Let me show you why summation by parts holds. And this actually would give you a visual interpretation of integration by parts in the discrete case. Actually, as you'll learn in Math 132, summation is actually integration with respect to a certain integrator. So summation actually can be thought of as a special case of integration where you're integrating over a discrete set. 
Okay, that's a, that's amazing. That's cool. But here, here, here. This is this is where the the proof comes from. Proof. Idea. By the way, the proof is not hard. You just write out everything. Okay, just just. Uh, if you write out everything, you can verify both sides are equal. Okay, so the algebraic proof gives no insight whatsoever. This is the it geometric proof. The geometric proof is this. It's not. So you imagine a square. <coughs> You're gonna love this. This is so cool. Jin Jing is like, yeah, I want to see this. Okay, here we go. Look. Imagine a square that's broken up into little pieces here. Like, um, how about uh, there's a little length here, A1, little length here, A2, little length here, A3. Yes, you with me? Little length here, A4. I'll just do, do four little chunks. Okay? Now, imagine uh, the Bs. Here's a little length, B1. Now, the B2 is actually the whole length here from the bottom to this point. That's B2. Let's make this B3. And let's make this B4. With me? Yeah? Oh, this is so cool. Watch. What is the sum ANBN? It's adding up these areas, isn't it? The sum of a and b n is the following. This is the first thing in the sum, this area, yes? This is the second thing in the sum. Yes? Yes? This is the third thing in the sum. This is just going to blow your mind when you see this. This is the fourth thing in the sum. I want the sum of these areas. Integration by parts says just take the total area of the box and subtract off the sum of these areas. Right? The integral of u dv, these are the little, uh, the little uh, dv's. Of course, I, I think I have my a's and b's switched, but oh well. Um, no, I think it's fine. That's right. This is dv. The, in, the, the integral of u dv is uv minus the integral of v du. Right? That's integration by parts. That's summation by parts. Okay? Isn't that cool? Now, of course, you can also see why there's a little offset here with these coefficients, right? The, the p and the q minus 1, not quite right here, p minus 1b, q minus 1. Well, it's just because, you know, when you're doing this in the discrete case, you know, you don't, you don't go to the very ends here for the, the, the blue squares, okay? It's just, that's, that's, that's all. And I've just done this also for the case where uh, p, is minus, uh, p is 0. But you can draw a similar picture if you push p out somewhere else. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Um, the algebraic proof. Just check both sides. That's really the message. Nothing there. Okay. But this does lead us to the following theorem. I claim if the big A sub n is bounded, big A sub n being this, the partial sums of the little a's, and the bn's are decreasing and approaching 0, then the sum of a n, b n converges. A nice, a nice result. Basically saying if these terms partial sums are bounded, and the bn's are going to 0, you're in good shape. This the series converges. Let's go ahead and prove this. Yes? Yes, they have to be positive and decreasing towards 0. Yeah, so maybe I should make that explicit. They're positive.
Um, uh, there's no, there's no, there's no reason why they couldn't. I mean, you just you get the same result. Ooh, interesting. That's where the proof comes in. So uh, it's going to be the case that we'll want these things to all have the same sign. And that's, uh, that's the main issue. So um, let's just write out again the proof idea. So how are we going to show that this thing converges? Well, we're going to use the, the, the Cauchy criterion for series. So let's suppose the partial sums are all bounded by big M. Well, OK. And suppose the BNs are decreasing going to 0. Well, then there exists a big N, big N, such that big, a little b sub big N is less than anything you like. Okay, but the anything that I want is for a given epsilon. So I should I forgot to say that. Given epsilon bigger than zero, let's say that b n is less than at past some point it's less than epsilon over two m. It turns out to be what I need. Well then for p and q bigger than n, and let's make q bigger than p, bigger than n. Well, let's look at this sum here. I'll call this sum. Um, I haven't seen triple smiley in a while. Triple smiley. Let's bound triple smiley. Beep, beep. OK, triple smiley. Um, it's kind of like that fish on The Simpsons that goes blink, blink, blink. OK. Well, let's see. So triple smiley has three terms, right? Well, it's got this sum and this crud and this crud, right? Yeah, but do you see that the fact that the A sub n's are bounded means that this portion could be bounded by big M, big M, and big M, right? So what you find here is basically something like the following. I can pull this out, and there's a, um, a sum of a B n minus bn plus 1. There's a bp. There's a bq. And uh, I, I think I can make all these uh, like so. And here's the part where we use the fact that these things are all bigger than 0 so that I can break everything up. And eventually, then, what you get is this is less than twice m. Uh, times bp. p is the biggest thing here. n goes from p to q minus 1. But then this is less than twice m b sub n, which is less than epsilon as desired. I've just bounded the tails by epsilon, and that's what I need for the Cauchy criterion. OK. Nice. That's a cool theorem. It's even cooler when you apply it to a specific example. So a, a, an example where, um, where uh, the BNs decrease and the ANs are bounded are the following. Suppose I have a bunch of Cs that are decreasing. So C1 uh, is bigger than C2 is bigger than in absolute value. And suppose that the C's are alternating in, in, uh, in sign. The CI's are alternating in signs. But their absolute values are decreasing. Well, the claim is that the sum of the CN's converge. Altern oh, and the terms go to 0. CI's alternating in sign, and they go to 0. Then a claim is the C, and the C sub n's converge. Then the C sub n's converge. So this is the alternating series test. Terms go to 0. They're alternating sign. They have to converge. Well, it follows very easily here. 
y, our proof, we basically just use as, uh, for a's and b's, we'll just let a n be the alternation minus 1 plus 1. Its partial sums are basically 1's and zeros, so it's bounded. And for the bn's, we'll just use the absolute values of the cn's. Very nifty. So what have we done with lots of these things? We're using the Cauchy criterion and uh, com comparing, um, well, those were comparisons with the geometric series. This was uh, just cutting things up a slightly different way. And uh, summation by parts became helpful. And uh, we're able to get these results as well. OK, very, very cool, very nice. Let's take a, a couple minute break. And after the break, I want to talk about absolute convergence, which is um, a very interesting concept. Uh, something I, I, I just realized before the break was, uh, right as the break was out, is that you know, this formula kind of looks wrong uh, for summation by parts, integration by parts. If you recall, it's uv minus v du. Yeah, so this is really should be a plus. And this should be a minus. But do you see that this is uv, right? Evaluate at the endpoints q and p. q is bigger than p. And this is minus v du. And the reason it's minus v du is because it's really minus du. If u is b, then du should be bn plus 1 minus bn. So that's where the sign comes from. OK. Good. So um, let's resume. Let's resume. Uh, I'm going to mention uh, just one more thing about, uh, about products of series. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll just mention it now. This is good. So um, if you want to take sums of series, we know, we know what it means to take the sum of series. You just sum term by term, right? So for instance, if I want to add a n plus the sum of b n. That's, that's the sum a n plus b n. That's, that's what I mean by the sum of the series. But a question you might ask is, what do we mean by the product of a series? Products. What does it mean to take the product of two series? So. Um, What do you think? What do you think we might mean by taking the product of two series? Well, it's not sum of a and b n. That's what you might think of as being product. It's not the natural way to define a product. So, let me mention that if you have two series, the product is actually defined slightly differently than you would think. So, um, let me give you the motivation, and then you'll see where the definition comes from. So. The motivation actually comes from power series. So in power series, you might have a series that starts off like this, a naught plus a1z plus a2z squared plus dot, dot, dot. And you might have a second series, b naught plus b1z plus b2z squared dot, 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 yeah? And if you ask somebody to take the product of these two series, what would you get? What's the first term? A naught, B naught. OK. What's the second term? A, it has a Z, single Z in it, right? So it comes from a, a term here and a term here. So that's either A1Z, B naught, or A naught, B1Z, yes? So the second term here is actually A1, B naught plus A naught, B1 times z. Yes? And the third term is three terms. And it either comes from a2, b0, or a1, b1, or a0, b2. OK? So Steve's happy with that. 
And uh, Maya probably can see the general pattern, which we won't write out. Dot, dot, dot. That's a good way to write the general <laughs> pattern. Love that. Yeah. So in fact, with this motivation, here's how we define the, the product series is you'll let Cn be the sum of Ak b sub n minus k. And k goes from 0 to n. And so the product series is, is defined to be, uh, it, it, it's, it's the sum of CNs, OK? It's not exactly what you would think of at first as a natural notion of a, of a product series. OK, now um, that uh, is cool. I want to save that picture. Here's the other, uh, the other thing, uh, the reason this is a product series and not the other, not the, not the thing you might think of, an, bn. If you, have a, if you have a series, sum of an, that converges to big A, and sum of bn that converges to big B, this series, sum of an, bn, won't converge to big A, big B. It won't converge to the product of these two, uh, the things these converge to. So this is not a good notion of a product. Yeah? But this one does under certain situations, OK? We just want to be a little careful there. So um, I'll just write this down. So one problem is um, the sum of Cn may not converge, even if the sum of a n and sum of b n do. Okay, but here's a theorem. You can say that it turns out if sum of a n and the sum of b n converge absolutely. I haven't said what that means yet, but we will in just a second. Then the sum of uh, Cn converges, the product series converges. Not only that, but if these converge absolutely and they converge to uh, A, big A, and big B, then this series converges and it converges to, take a guess, AB. Okay. Um, not necessarily. Good question. I, uh, I'm not sure. But it converges to big A, big B. Yes? When you say product series, is that actually just the sum of the CNs, or is it the sum of the CNs and the CNs? No, it's just some of the CNs. Yeah, so the, I'm just saying this is the motivation, where the power series here, of course, is the, the terms are a n z to the n, b n z to the n. Then the product series would be a n uh, c n z to the n. But if the power series, if the series is, is just sum of an, sum of bn, then the product series is defined to be sum of cn. Okay, good question. Yes. Oh, I haven't defined it. I'm just telling. I'm motivating that. Hey, you know, there's a concept here that's going to be helpful for us. Okay, so we're about to define this. Okay. Okay. I'm not going to prove this. Uh, I'm, I'm more interested that you realize that there are theorems that deal with it. There are actually a couple of theorems in the book that talk about product series and conditions under which they converge. Um, so I encourage you to, to look at them. But you should just be aware that um, there are conditions under which these things converge. And this motivates the concept of co absolute convergence. So absolute convergence is, uh, is basically um, a, a, a kind of convergence where you look at absolute values, right? So we're going to define, this, we'll say a series with, you know, maybe positive or negative terms converges absolutely if the associated series with absolute values converges. 
That's what absolute convergence means. So an uh, example would be an alternating sum of reciprocals. Does this converge absolutely? By the way, does this converge? Yes, it's an alternating sum of terms that go to 0 and uh, are decreasing and go to 0. Uh, so this actually converges, but not absolutely. Because its absolute series is going to be the harmonic series, not absolutely. Okay. Now, uh, a cool theorem is that if a series converges absolutely, then it converges. So if it converges, it may not converge absolutely, but if the sum of ans converge absolutely, then it converges. That's an important fact. And the proof is very easy, the idea. Of course it converges, because if I'm estimating the sum, the Cauchy criterion says look at the tail. k goes from n to m. But that's bounded by the sum of a sub k's. And this tail goes from n to m. But this is the tail of the absolutely convergent series. And you know this is small by the Cauchy criterion. So this is small by the Cauchy criterion for the series at sum of a sub k. So if you can make that small, use the same big N for a given epsilon to make this small, and you're in good shape. Okay. Okay, so one of the things that's, uh, so I've given you one reason why absolute convergence might be interesting. That is, it, you know, it makes uh, certain things that aren't nice, nice. Okay. Here's another situation where um, things might go really bad if a series doesn't converge absolutely. And that's the last topic today, is the conflict of rearrangements. So if you take a series, you might ask, well, what if I sum things in a different order? So here's a question. Let's suppose you have a, a sum of a series, and it converges to some big, some big sum A, some sum A, big A. Here's a question. If I rearrange the terms, must it converge? What do you think? Give me any series, and I rearrange the terms. If it, suppose a series converges, I rearrange the terms. Do you think the rearranged series has to converge? Now people say yes. Now people say no. OK, yeah, you've probably guessed that, because I said something bad was happening, right? So here, so first, uh, the answer is no. May not necessarily converge. Do you think if it converges, it has to converge to A? Some people say yes. Some people say no. To A, turns out the answer is so. If it does converge, does it converge to A? The answer to this is a big resounding no as well. So what I want to um, show you as a final example is, in fact, an example of why this why things can go bad. So here's an example. Look at this example. This thing converges, right? Anybody know what it converges to? Oh, come on. Some of you must know. Converges to log of 2. Excellent. But guess what? It not only would a rearrangement not necessarily converge to log 2, but I can get it to converge to any number you like. Really? You give me a number. Give me a number. Steve. Pi. Get it converged to pi. So this is a result due to Riemann. Not the pi result, but if uh, 
the sum of the ands converge, but not absolutely, then uh, a rearrangement can have any limit you like. Actually, you know what? It's even worse than that. It can have any limb soup and limb inth you like. So it may not even converge, but you can get it to, you know, you can get it to do basically whatever you want. Um, if it, it does converge absolutely, guess what? It has to converge to the same value. Okay, so this is what's amazing. So alternately, if it converges absolutely, all rearrangements have the same limit. Amazing fact, and this is one of the main reasons for caring about con absolute convergence. Let me show you how to get this series to converge to pi with a suitable rearrangement. Take a look at the, the, every, the odd terms. Would you agree they're all positive? One, a third, a fifth, a seventh, yes? What can you say about that series? It diverges, doesn't it? Some of the odd reciprocals, yeah? The other ones are even reciprocals. What can you say about those? That series. Diverges, right? So those get as large as you like. So the positive terms get as large as you like, yes? So I'm just going to add a bunch of positive terms. And would you agree, Steve, that eventually the sum of these reciprocals will eventually be bigger than pi, just barely? There will be a first time when it's bigger than pi, yes? OK, now I've overshot. So I'm going to go back. Let's now start subtracting off the odd terms, the even terms. And I'll go far enough back so that I just overshoot pi again. So make sure, so do it so that this is now less than pi, or less than pi. And then, I'll start where I left off with the positive terms, make it bigger than pi, less than pi, bigger than pi, less than pi, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yep. And, uh, and you'll get a series that converges to pi. Pretty nifty. Amazing fact about rearrangements. If it's not absolutely convergent, you can get it to do whatever you want. Limb soups, limb imps, whatever. OK, great. Have fun. We will see you on Wednesday, and on Wednesday we'll begin start to start talking about continuity.